Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Today's interview with Ivan Rados is number 400. So congratulations, Ivan. You just lucked out Thank to be you. number 400. <laughs> um, yeah, if anyone is discovering this for the first time and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, uh, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu where you'll find all the previous ones organized and categorized in four or five different ways. Um, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there is a donate button on every page of the site. So as I just hinted, um, today's guest is Ivan Rados. I'll just read a quick bio of him and then we'll get into it. Um, Ivan, who also goes by the spiritual name Atma, is a meditation master who was born in the former Yugoslavia. At the age of 42, he experienced a profound inner awakening that changed his perception of himself and reality, after which he was devoted to integrating his, no his knowing into his being, marking the beginning of a movement towards the inner point, which he calls the middle point. He started teaching meditation regularly from his healing studio in Vancouver. As a healer, Atma is a true master of both himself and his life. He asserts that he heals no one, but simply helps people <coughs> heal themselves through the power of consciousness. His journey reads like a book of miracles, which he modestly labels ordinarinesses. We'll be talking about that. The wisdom he shares comes from his deep roots in the One Self, the source of everything. Atma has assisted thousands in reconnecting with their state of health in personal personal, group, and long-distance sessions. He is not associated with any particular spiritual movement, religion, or tradition. His deep and authentic rooting in the unknown provides him the insight and ability to be of great service to the evolution of consciousness in these most transformative of times. He travels extensively, taking his knowingness throughout the world, facilitating meditation classes, talks, intensives, and retreats. So welcome. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome for inviting me. Did I do that? Oh, inviting you. I, 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 I thought you said enlightening <laughs> you. No, I didn't do that. Invitation. Yeah, <laughs> I invited you. I didn't enlighten you. Um, yes, you're welcome. Uh, you came recommended by a number of people. Uh, okay. So the former Yugoslavia, what year was that that you were born? Um. <laughs> 40, 42 I, I years mean, old. Uh, my body was born in former Yugoslavia. Oh yeah, I mean that's what we. I mean. have a relationship with my body, but not with the place where my body was born. Right. Okay. <laughs> it was uh, body was born in I don't know fifty three four five years, uh, sixty two. So you count sixty two. Okay. I'm not obsessed by numbers and by the age. That's okay. So. And when did you leave Yugoslavia? Or when? <laughs> uh, where did I leave my Yugoslavia? I left a couple of times, but mm -hmm. just three days before the war, I just left. I, I just said, that's it. I don't want to participate in any madness. Mm. And I left. And since then, I just cut my past totally. That's why I said I'm not related to the place. I'm right. related to my body. Yeah. Um, and in some way, you're not even related to that, I suppose. But we'll, we'll talk <laughs> well, about that. I have to live in my body in this life. That's true. Uh, I don't know what kind of other bodies will I get when I go somewhere else, but I'm very happy with this body right now. Good. Um, well, I'm glad you got out of there when you did. So, uh, so you experienced at the age of 42. How old are you now, body-wise? Uh, body-wise. 150. <laughs> hey, well preserved. Well, you lost your hair, but otherwise you look good. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's you know, like tiring, isn't it? <laughs> Hang your body around. I'd rather, I'd rather fly, but you know, I have a, I'm very fortunate to have, you know, my beloved Lana who is holding me back on earth, mm -hmm. grounding me. Otherwise, I'm just, I mean, you know, my, my, my main excuse is I'm an artist, so I can hide my madness behind being an artist, you see. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, my father was a professional artist, too. <clears throat> just, don't go, just don't go cutting off your ear. You have nice ears. <laughs> um, so what was this, uh, you know, 
profound inner waking that happened when you were 42? What happened? Uh, oh. Uh, and why did it happen? Had you been doing some kind of spiritual practice or something? I mean, you see, I've been, I've been searching all my life uh, for something that I thought is, you know, whatever enlightenment. Mm -hmm. You know, I had an idea of what enlightenment is. I had a concept. I have an entire theory behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was studying everything along the way just to, you know, find, uh, you know, to confirm my idea. Mm -hmm. See? And uh, searching and searching and searching, but never ever finding, really. Right. But along my search, I was expressing myself through my art. I was being creative with myself. I was drawing out my consciousness. Mm -hmm. you know, and let me go back when I was a kid. Sure. And um, that was my first recollect, you know, my first memories when I was a kid, when I was young. It's, uh, you know, I was maybe grade one, grade two, and uh, I would touch kids if they have any problems, stomachache, toothache, headache, whatever they, even when they are hurt, when they're emotionally disturbed, when, when they're anxious, I had a, I don't know, empathy, compassion to come hug them, put my hand on their stomach, on their, you know, on their face to heal the tooth or whatever, and they would be better and they would run around and mm. I would be a little bit tired. You know, my body will be tired. It'll drain you a little bit. A little bit draining. I remember those moments where I would be totally depleted in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh God. Anyway, a uh, uh, principal called my mom. My mom went there and whatever they were talking. My mom said, came home and said, you know, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> I said, what? I mean, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. So she said, you You've been doing wrong. Everyone was unhappy. Their teachers were unhappy talking about it. You're distracting the classes and not distracting kids. And other parents are, t you know, talking is like, oh my God. So I didn't know what to do. So I went to my grandma and my grandma said, oh my son, you are, you came with that. Whatever you came with that. Energy, compassion, you know, ability to heal or whatever. Uh, but, you know, there are two ways you can do that. You can continue doing it or suppress it. What are you going to do? I didn't know what kind of suppression means, but forgetting it. Don't do that mm. in a way. And I said, is there any third option? <laughs> said this and I said, what do you think? I said, can I change it into something else? Because I was playing and I was, you know, I was playing with a you know, outside changing, changing the positions of rocks, for example. That you, was my you, could, you could move them with your mind, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, making rocks in certain geometrical patterns and forms. I was playing with sacred geometry when oh. I was... Oh, with your hands you were doing. You weren't with moving, my hands, you weren't moving them around with your mind. Okay, you're making patterns and things. Something that is geometrically in shape that right. I feel all right and I feel protected and safe and whatever. I was playing with that while other kids were playing Tarzans and whatever, football. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and she said, what do you think? I said, can I channel? She said, yes, you can. What do you want? to do in life. I said, I want to be an artist. He said, that's the way to channel. So that's where I went. So I become an artist. So that becomes my spiritual search, even though I didn't realize that while I was searching for external confirmation and confirmation of my idea of what enlightenment is. Mm -hmm. so, so I could not find. So I went into and then at one point I was I was painting, I was studying and I used to go for five days, no food, no drinking, or maybe drinking water, but no food, no sleep, just painting, painting, and be so frustrated, so angry. I would rip up my canvases in my studio. I will, I would do crazy stuff. Even I would take the canvas outside, even though someone might pass by and say, wow, what a gorgeous work. I would take it out and burn it. Wow. And I was painting, painting, you know, those, those uh, segments uh, almost every month, a couple of times of so five, six, seven days, no food, no sleeping. It's just like going through until I knock myself down and sleep for 48 hours. At one point, 
I said to my beloved Lana, I'm going, I might be, you know, I don't know, I might be 10 days now. You know, I'm going totally fasting for 23 days, but I'm not going to sleep 10 days. Mm. I'm going to paint. And the fifth day, I was painting, I was throwing canvas, you know, the raw oil on, on the canvas. And just I fall. I fall unconscious. Mm -hmm. You know, and I regain consciousness immediately and I realize I'm on the floor. And I'm not able to move. I'm not able even to think where I am. I'm just aware that I am. It just like happened instantaneously. It's not like, you know, I was there not thinking, oh, this is whatever the spiritual, you know, epiphany that people talk about. It is, this is the realization. This is the final end of my search. It was just blank piece of canvas. It's just being aware that I am. Hmm. I was, I could not even say that I was blissful. There is no bliss there. There is nothing, nothing at all. Just blank. It was like instant, like a popcorn. Mm -hmm. Fall down, could not move, and you know, left without consciousness, regain consciousness again, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there, I don't know for how long. Later on, people, someone would try to knock on my studio. My beloved Lana tried to call me, but. Uh, People said that I've been three to five days. I'm not sure. So anyway, when I start thinking, the thought came on its own after three, four, five days of just really being blank, even not sleeping, wow. not not blinking, you're just being frozen. And then my uh, and the thought came, and the thought ran through my mind, and I could just see the thought running through. And the thought said, you are a failure. <laughs> and I had, uh, for the first time in my life, I was using my mind. I had the ability to use my mind. And I used my mind. I invited the thought in collections of all other thoughts, which are not mine, they are borrowed. All our thoughts are borrowed, by the way. So I used some, you know, thought or other thoughts and collected collected some kind of idea, you know, what I was going through and what is happening, why the thought came and left, what that thought means. It means invitation. It means the idea is invitation, inviting me to again go into that dualistic aspect of reality where I will try to find someone who never fails and could not fail, but find the consequence of failing all the time. So it's also like, you know, causes and consequences. The mind is all about causes and consequences, but I was there not choosing, but using something just to contemplate, designate and create something for myself. And from that point, from that point, I woke up, got up, collected myself, went home and said to Lana, I've been unconscious because she could not understand. I said, I've been unconscious for some time. You see, but everything is fine. <laughs> that was the that was the event. I mean, if I call it an event, yeah, nothing happens really. Nothing at all. It's just blank piece of paper, just nothingness. You know, but something changed afterwards. You know, the perception of self, the perception of reality I live in, definition of self and definition of reality. Mm -hmm. You see, it's also like it becomes more fluid, not strict and rigid. I mean, when you define something and then you try to protect that definition, you try to save that definition, you try to invest in that definition, you try to sell that definition to someone else that someone else might adore you, you know, and then you can feel okay, your ego can be, you know, can, can feel blissful. Is it not that kind of? Is it? So let me ask you a couple of questions about that. So you're, you're about 42 years old, you were pushing and pushing and pushing in terms of your art, you'd go days on end without sleeping or, or eating, just drinking water. And I'm just re re reiterating what you said, just to make sure I got it straight. And then at a certain point, you had this collapse. You, you, it was some kind of breakthrough. And, uh, and then you sat there for four or five days with no thoughts in your head, not, not sleeping, just sitting like a stone. Um, and then you finally began to engage in activity again. Is, is that a... a is that a quick synopsis of, of what you just said? That's right. Yeah. 
I think there's there's more to it, which you know, even if I want to write a book about it, right, it's not gonna fit in 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 a hundred books because you know, from the from the nothing. When you, if you experience nothing, I mean, I mean, I don't know whether I experience nothing. It was just nothing is happening. You know, see, if that's the experience, so be it. But you know, later on, you know, the pre, when you change the perception of self, mm-hmm. obviously you change the perception of reality you live in because you know you change yourself. Reality is changed. You know, don't change the war out there. Don't bring the peace. Change yourself. You know, bring peace to yourself. Find the peace within yourself. The peace is everywhere else. You know, the way you see yourself, you create reality because reality is a mirror of you, nothing else. Mirror will never ever blink to you. You have to blink first mm-hmm. and the mirror, mirror react. That's how powerful we are. Yeah. You see, how we define best, you, ourselves, we define God, we define existence, we define the wholeness. Someone said, uh, it's, I forget who said this, but it's, it's a lot easier to put, sh- put shoes on than pave the world with leather. Yeah, but people, people, ninety nine point ninety nine percent of people are putting their, you know, stone in their shoes. Yeah, but you know, I mean, in other words, the the allegory means that easier to change yourself than to change the world. If you can, you know, put shoes on, so to speak, uh, that that's that's a lot more simple than making the whole world covered with leather. You just you know, change yes. yourself, and then you change so what, the world. So what happened later was, you know, something that. I never, ever, ever could think about would come into my mind, and I would choose whether to use that or not. And you what know? was and that? I, it's whatever, whatever. It's not the choice. It's more, it's more multiple, infinite number of choices I can choose. I mean, people generally have two choices: to you know, left or right, positive or negative. You know, that's very dualistic. But when you come from the point where the things are coming in multiple way, multidimensionally, and you have infinite number of choices, which one you want to choose? It's not just two, it's infinite number. Mm-hmm. It's a like spectrum between consciousness and unconsciousness. Consciousness and consciousness are not separate entities. There's only consciousness. Unconsciousness is lack of consciousness, the same as you know, darkness is lack of light. So in between unconsciousness and consciousness, there is an entire spectrum of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So intuitive one will be the one you are more excited. The intuitive intuitive one. Exactly. So that's that's what changed. Another thing what changed was the amount of understanding that comes. It's sort of like a brief instant. You see, uh, it's sort of like more like more like intuition coming and staying for a while and the mind forming and wanting to hitchhike the, the, the intuition and bring duality into it. You know, this is good, this is not, I don't believe that, I believe that this is real, this is not real. That, those kind of conflict inside the mind. But, you know, but there is that deeper, deeper knowing I'm not my mind. Mm-hmm. And the mind yields yeah. to your consciousness. You see, the whole problem, the whole problem in, in the world is not what appears outside reality and outside reality in objective reality. It is the it is the attachment to that to the to the idea I am my mind. Mm-hmm. You see. So from that perspective, mind is illusion. So you can take his uh, you know its suggestions and ideas and choices, you know, in consideration, but you are the one who is gonna choose, really. And that's how you use my mind. So in a way, after that experience, I start using my mind when I need to designate, create, and communicate. And when I don't need my mind, I have ability which came from maybe that experience that I could switch the my mind, my mind on. Mm-hmm. Off. Okay, let me ask you a few questions about uh, the things you just said. So, so firstly, when you went into that state for four or five days, were you aware of the surroundings, or were you just sort of in a samadhi state or something where you weren't even aware of sensory input? I was aware of, I was aware of okay. breathing. I was aware of my blood. But you were just I was sitting aware there. of the sound of passing cars in okay. front of my studio. I was aware of. Even the, the the you know flipping wing of the of the fly mm-hmm. around. I mean, I was aware of the invitation 
brush invitation to move him around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even that, you know, it's like like temptation, move me. I'm, you know, my purpose is to move the color around the canvas, move me, please. You know, that kind of thing. It's it is the absolutely real, mm-hmm. absolutely intensive, absolutely uh, tranquil, and absolutely inviting to engage in all kinds of phantasmagoric dreams if I want. But you know, obviously, there is no reason, there is no need because that kind of state is you can't do anything. Yeah. Even so, it's not that you cannot do anything. You don't want to do anything mm. because it is the state where there is no pressure, there is no anxiety, there is no stress, there is no worries. There is nothing there putting you under an enormous heaviness. You see, people say love and light. You see. Ooh. What's the light? You know, I'm bringing you light. Light is not being heavy, being light, not carrying the weight of your thoughts, not being suppressed and compressed by your thinking, which is positive, negative. You see, when you remove your mind, if you remove your mind, if you can remove your mind or something or someone can remove your mind, then you find nothing. And that's if that's the place, so be it. Okay. So when you first snapped into that state, you you basically didn't have motivation to paint or talk or no, eat. I or, you just sat there. I didn't have motivation for... to wake up. I right. didn't have motivation to you know close my eyes. It was just like there is no motivation because I did. It seems like I didn't have mind, but yeah. I could not recollect that not having a mind because you know you can only recollect that when you have a mind. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's yeah. very dualistic in nature, so I have to be controversial in order for people to understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's like you, you can't, re- you can't remember tried. sleeping because... I'm going to fail. Right. But, you know, I tried. Yeah. And you asked a really tough question, trying to explain unexplainable, really. Mm-hmm. How can I do that? How can I explain my subjective reality to you? you know, how, I, how can really, anyone, you know, tr- oh. try, try, try explaining red? What does red look like? Well, I don't know. It looks like red. <laughs> you can't explain oh, it. I tried to read my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the second Try question I have. <laughs> second question I have is like you were talking about million a million choices, and then you would choose just one. And it kind of reminded me of an example from physics, where if you take a ball and throw it, there are a million, you know, infinite number of paths the ball could take, but it takes the path of least action. Given all the forces and influences, it takes the most efficient possible path when you throw it. And so I'm kind of wondering if that would be a good descriptor of your experience, where you have a million possibilities, but if you follow the intuitive choice, it ends up being the most sort of perfect in a way that the individual mind could never have figured out. Nature is balancing itself all the time. Right, nature did it, does it for you. I mean, nature. Right. What's nature? Nature is part of existence. Mm-hmm. So existence is existing in itself mm-hmm. and it's balanced so it does not need to balance itself it always thrives to balance itself you're part of nature so naturally and you know existentially you are balancing yourself if you are not balancing yourself then the balance will balance itself so you are not necessary in that in that process at all mm-hmm. okay and then the third question is you know you're talk- you're saying something which kind of reminds me of a analogy that Ramana Maharshi used to use about a fan, you know, which is spinning, and then you turn off the power, and it still spins for a while and gets slower and slower as it winds down. And I'm wondering if you have something like that in your own experience, where this big shift happened, and then since then, there's been a kind of a winding down and a playing out of tendencies and habits and conditioned responses and so on. They've just been sort of winding down over over the years since then. Does that make any sense? Can you can you a little bit explain further what what's behind your thinking? Why I'm asking this question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes Ramana and other teachers have used the example that you know when the individual is kind of the motivating force of action or thinks he, that he is, uh, you know, there's a certain momentum like a fan spinning because of its motor. And then that, I understand that. Yeah. And then that when enlightenment dawns, uh, that motivation is no longer there. And yet it doesn't just stop instantly. Okay. It, it okay. sort of winds down. I see. Yeah. I see. I see where you're getting, where, where you want to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, you see, we have mind. We know the mind. You know, we talk about mind. Yeah. But we talk about mind as conscious mind. And you see all kinds of books and spiritual movements and, you know, motivational speakers, gurus and 
you know, masters of reality and themselves, they talk about consciousness and conscious mind. Mind and consciousness are diametrically opposite of each other. Why don't you define mind. them both well at this point since, you know, how do you I, use I'm those trying, terms? I'm trying my best. Okay, okay yeah. Mind is not. Consciousness is. Mm -hmm. The mind is not. It is, it is a social product. It is social indoctrinated state of being. So your mind is not owned by you. It is owned by society. It is owned by the collective. The mind is illusion, a bubble. So the mind cannot exist without an energy. It needs energy. It is superficial. It is illusion. So it needs energy. Mm -hmm. Wholeness is the energy, infinite one, a energy in itself. Wholeness, oneness, God, existence, the universe, whatever you want to call it, however you want to call it. So the wholeness is expressing itself as it is. Wholeness is wholeness expressing itself through infinite pieces. Every single piece of that wholeness is the wholeness in itself, expressing itself through infinite pieces. And every single piece on that, it is expressing it. It goes infinitely, infinitely, infinite. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how the wholeness is expressing itself? And what is the wholeness? First, let's ask the question, what is the wholeness? Wholeness is awareness. Awareness that the wholeness is. Awareness that I am, without I, just amness. Do you get it? Oh yeah. So wholeness is the wholeness. Awareness is awareness. Expressing itself as the consciousness. Because consciousness is the movement, while the awareness is the moment. The moment right now is awareness, while the movement of now is the consciousness. The movement is happens through experiences, uh, in objective and subjective reality. It's like wave moving and creating the particle, creating something that is objective, that is in form, that you can include, you know, that, you know, invites the senses, that you can have a grasp of it, you can go through it, you can define it, you can analyze it, you can see it from different perspectives. You see, that's what consciousness is, it can examine itself because everything is consciousness it can examine itself expand itself understand itself from different angle of seeing it so that's the whole point so the consciousness is the movement awareness is the moment so the mind is artificial entity created in between awareness and consciousness and using the energy of consciousness not using because it is stealing, it is you who is voluntarily giving that to the mind by being attached to that artificial creation. Do you have a mind? Do I have a mind? I don't have a mind, but I use my mind. Okay, so it's a tool. It's a tool. It's a it's a machine. It's an organic machine. It is perfect machine. And when you, when you say that the society creates the mind or something like that, you know, what if a person lived in a cave and didn't have any interaction with yeah. society? Would they have a mind? Listen, it's not about creation of the mind. Mind creates itself as, as, as a superficial entity, uh, you know, as, as a similar to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of like uh, a reality we all agree to, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, reality that is common between us. The, it's like society. Society does not exist. Society lives in people's minds. And thoughts exist as a collective, you know, uh, unconsciousness. Okay, so uh, it's not about it's not about a society creating the mind. The society is attaching your consciousness to artificial creating attachment to the idea of who you are. Mm -hmm. Small kid, not having the mind, having the consciousness, being receptive, open, going through, having experiences, not ever holding that into the experience, not ever possessing the experience, or defining the experience just going through. While the society is jumping in saying, don't do this, do that. This is right, this is wrong. So the, 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 the consciousness is attaching itself to one aspect of the wholeness, one aspect of duality. And inevitably, the other one has been rejected. So that is the that's the separation. That's how we create the mind, or society creates the mind. It's not like oh, let's create the mind in in the small kid. It is unconscious act of 
unkindness, unconscious act of so-called love. We do that unconsciously. You see, that's the Jesus on the cross saying, God, forgive them because they don't, you know, those people, they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I, th if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the mind is an innocent tool. I guess we need to have a mind in order to function, but the, the mind gets conditioned. Like when you were a little kid and you were healing people and the, the authority said, no, you can't do that, that's bad. And so that left an impression on you. So it's sort of like society conditions and narrows and limits and, you know, boxes us in a as we go along. Um, and so if that's, that's right. if that's a correct response to what you're saying, then what, what is the practical takeaway from what you've been saying for the past few minutes? Um, if someone's listening to this and, you know, what can they take from what you've just said that would help them in some way in their life? First of all, you see, we have to raise a question. That's called existential question. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to raise that question. You know, because it exists since the beginning of separation. And the question is, who am I? Right. You know, who am I, really? You know, that's the most important question. Is the same question that never, ever anyone asked me the question, what is the meditation? You know, we, you know, just look at the schools of meditation everywhere. I mean, everyone is teaching meditation. You know, and never, ever did anyone ask what is the what is the meditation who am i you know what is the mind what what is the question what do you mean it no one inquiry. ever asked that haven't people been asking that sort of question never i mean who never what in your is experience the meditation? anyway it doesn't really matter you know yeah. what is the mind there is no mind only thoughts are the thoughts real no they are cause then what is the mind beyond thoughts? There is no mind beyond thoughts. So mind doesn't have form, neither it is a single thought, but a constant flow of thoughts. So thoughts don't have form, but they can create form. Hmm. Form is unreal, part of illusion, the same as the mind. Everything that has a form is an illusion. To be attached to form is to be possessed by, by the mind and be in the separation. So imagine this. Imagine the mind being on one side of the tube. Imagine the tube, hollow tube or hollow bamboo. Mind on the other and the wholeness on, on, on the other side. Okay, They cannot fit together because the mind is non-existential, the wholeness is, is existential. So. Now imagine the no mind. What is no mind? No thoughts in it. Right. It is hollow tube. It is the absolute creative act, kind act, grateful act from wholeness to people, mm -hmm. to consciousness. So the consciousness can experience different realities, different densities. Mm -hmm. So it is a hollow tube. So now on one side is your consciousness on the other side is the wholeness. The energy goes smoothly. It goes pulsating, coming and going. It's like breathing. Imagine the society clogging the mind, clogging that no mind and creating the mind, blocking it, giving idea, giving, giving definitions, giving beliefs, giving theories, giving hypotheses, giving, giving assumptions, giving all that which is the question mark giving the question mark, embedding it, stumping it into no mind, and the mind got disconnected totally. It becomes on one side of polarity and the wholeness on the other side. So it's also like, uh, you know, uh, this town is too small for us. One has to go or one has to die. So the mind attempt is to deny the wholeness and exist in itself, while the wholeness is saying, oh, this is my lost son. He will come one day when he realized that it's time to come home. Hmm. Uh, I'm following you. I, I hope people listening are following you. If they aren't, they should submit a question. <laughs> that is you're following me. <laughs> no, I am. Uh, and it, for, for what you've been saying for the last couple of minutes reminds me of something in the Yoga Sutras, the second verse. It says, yoga, is this, yoga meaning union, is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. 
And then it says the seer rests in himself or in, in itself. So it's like you can sort of think of the mind as agitated water or something. And then the water calms down, settles down. And when it's completely settled, there's no waves anymore. So there, you know, so mind is waves, settled water is no waves. And so it yeah. sounds to me like what you're saying is, you know, the mind is this sort of, it consists of thoughts, it consists of agitation, it consists of a sort of a imbalance in a way. Uh, and then if we could come into balance, step, you know, settle down the agitation to a point of no agitation, then there would be no mind at that point, and we would know the self, or know reality, or, or whatever terms you want to use. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, you know, uh, understand this. I'm not against the mind. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not against the society. I'm not against anything. I'm all for freedom mm -hmm. from all my constructs, from the attachment, yeah. from all my mechanical habits and its structures. Yeah, I, I gathered that. I didn't get the yes, impression it, it, you were it against is it. the freedom. When you understand what mind is, mm -hmm. then you will have a greater freedom. Yeah. Then you can use the mind or not use the mind. But at the moment, your mind is using you. You cannot stop your thinking. You cannot do anything to your thinking. You cannot eliminate thoughts. You cannot do anything. And that's where the frustration is. And that's where, that's where the suffering is. Mm -hmm. Because that's the feeling of being powerless. Yeah. You, see, you can't stop anxiety, you cannot stop pain, you cannot stop worrying, you cannot stop fear. How can you do that? You know, but the consciousness can go through. And that's what I'm advising. Go through. How to go through everything you're experiencing. Not seeing everything that you're experiencing as real and as you. Mm -hmm. yes. Everything that passes by is not real and it's not you. You are the observer of things that are moving, that are transforming, that are moving from one place to another. One thought from positive to negative and negative to positive. You're just witnessing, you're just moving and you're not participating and you're not attaching yourself or identifying with it. Not identifying with the process of that. Yeah, I think that's the key point right there. You're not saying there's anything wrong with the mind or anything wrong with activity or anything else. You're just saying there's something wrong with attachment. Uh, or or ident like ident no identification, there. yeah. That's right. Yeah, we become sort of, we have blinders on if, if we're attached and identified. We sort of lose the forest for the trees, so to speak. Yeah, be be because, you know, people have to remember that they cannot use the mind before they know how to be without the mind. Yeah. When someone say to you, you know, get lost, you know, you know, you know get out of your mind. It's not a negative statement. Say thank you to those people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of my mind. Yeah. Yes, because when I'm out of my mind, there is no anxiety. <laughs> and so what's wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yes, I guess it's a question of how you get out of your mind, you know? You, you, it's just like, you know, when I'm talking to you, I'm using my mind. Right. When I don't talk to you, why, why should I use my mind? To, yeah. To torture myself with the same thoughts? Because thoughts are repetitive. They are moving in the circular way. You know, from positive to negative. It's not like jumping from positive to negative. There's an entire, like pendulum, entire spectrum. While moving from the positive, you're building the momentum of negative, and you reach the, mom, you know, the the end of of negative. Then you move from to the positive, from positive, and it goes like a swing. You see, that's what 24 hours a day activity is in your mind. Mm -hmm. So how to get out of it? Of it, you cannot get rid of it. You cannot do anything to your mind. You can only be a witness to your mind, and through the witnessing, the mind will drop itself. Yes. That's how you become no mind. With no, with no attempt to get rid of your mind. If you have attempt to get rid of mind, then the mind will really give you a hard time. Okay, so one thing that, I, that occurred to me a lot as I was reading your book is you were describing things like being a witness to your mind, for instance, that phrase you just used. And it, it kind of reminded, it reminded me of a kind of a perennial issue that comes up in spiritual circles and in these interviews. And that is that, you know, are we, are we taking a, a, a description as a prescription? And let me just give an example to clarify it. Let's, let's say someone's standing on a mountaintop and he's shouting out 
an explanation of the view, what he sees from the mountaintop. And people are halfway down the mountain, and they're hearing that explanation. They're thinking, wow, that sounds really great. That sounds really inspiring. What they really need is instructions on how to climb from where they are up to where that guy is. And then they will see the same view he sees, and they won't need his explanation. They'll have their own view. But what often happens is that people mistake Ex description of the view, so to speak, as a prescription for what to do. So a person like, let's say, hears that they hear the term witnessing. And in a certain state of awareness, witnessing is natural, it's spontaneous, one is not attached to one's thoughts or perceptions or overshadowed by them. You know, the, the clear light of the self prevails just no matter what you're engaged in. But if you but that's an, it's a sort of a natural condition. Now, but if you try to witness, if you make an effort of it, it's, it's almost like the person halfway down the mountain uh, kind of imagining what the guy is describing who is speaking from the top of the mountain and maybe even convincing themselves that they're having the same experience, but in fact they're not having the same experience. It's an imagination. It's a mood. It's, it's not the, the actual state of being on the mountaintop. So, do you get the metaphor, and you, and what do you say yeah. to, to that whole statement? Yeah, uh, you know, this is <laughs> this is natural uh, way of the mind uh, that is trained to submit itself to higher authority, whatever that authority is. It could be political, it could be religious. You know, okay. you know, submit yourself to God. You know, adore God, give yourself to God. You know, you know, you are not God is. You know that kind of concept. You know, you can you can find validity in it, but you know, but it's, it's mainly a concept. mind concept. It is yeah. concept. You know. So, anyway. Um, yeah, and a concept of God yeah. doesn't really satisfy exactly. any more than yes, a concept it, of food is going to fill your belly. Yeah. Yes, of course. You know, someone from the top yelling at people, you know, look at what I could do, it's just nothing else than the ego. Why do you need to declare that? Why do you need to announce that? Why do you need to invite well, anyone? Well, it's just an experience? analogy, though, I'm, that yeah, illustrates I know, a certain I know, but point. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Okay. So, you know, so there is no need, uh, you know, but even that perception of the guy is very limited because he is addressing someone and asking experience what I want to experience. And people might be tempted to, you know, they might say, okay, oh, but this is this is really good, you know, just a slight, slight urge to get out of your comfort zone is a, is is the you know the end result is 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 enlightenment, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just a glimpse. It it's just matter of uh, it's just matter of you know process mm -hmm. how it unfold. It could be a year, it could be 20, it could be a million years, it doesn't really matter, you know, time is infinite and it's always now, you know. So it's not a time of, you know, past and future, but real time, which is the moment of now. So anyway, uh, in order, in order to really reach your destination, uh, whatever your destination, you know, desire is good if you have only one desire, which is essential, desire to be. Every other desire is, is not to be. And then it's projection, it's illusion, you are some, somewhere else. So desire to be. But the desire cannot be kept alive in your mind. Otherwise, that desire will be the mind. And the mind will give you the idea of what desire, you know, what, what enlightenment is, what being is. But at one point, you will get out of your sleep and realize that you've been dreaming and you will start from the beginning. So. You, it's good to have a desire, to have, you know, urge and uh, to be motivated to push the energy, you know, but you have to give up on pushing, you have to give up on searching, you have to give up on m being motivated, allow the process to unfold. So you push yourself into the spiritual quest, into the journey, but do not conclude anything along the way and do not try to ignite that at all. Just to remember that you already did intent. That's the desire. One desire to be is the pure intent to be. Not intention. There's no tension there. It is still part of the tension. Intent is the still part of the tension by just once. And then you go through. If you repeat the in intent, then it becomes intention. Then you are in your mind locked in your concept of enlightenment. Then instead of climbing the mountain and reaching the top, seeing your own perspective, having your own perception, then you are going around the mountain, 
believing that you're climbing the mountain. Right. Even though it's a little bit hilly around the mountain and you think, <laughs> oh, I'm climbing, but you're going in the circle. And that's the way of the mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a little while ago you said that people don't ask what meditation is or something like that. And um, you teach meditation. And I'm always interested in uh, practical means for people to experience for themselves. Um, not not sort of just entertain themselves with f philosophies or notions or concepts, but have it be a genuine experience. Um, so, you know, what do you teach, and uh, you know, how is it that? So, so you know, what do you take? What do you do to help people move from just sort of reading concepts in one of your books to actually living the reality of what those concepts represent? Um. It's really difficult to define my work, um, you see, because I don't teach anything. <laughs> if I but teach, you have a whole chapter in your book on meditation, so that's know. right. You know, but I, I, I'm answering. You know, so it's I don't teach, uh, but I cannot go away from teaching because any time you open your mouth, you teach. You teach either yourself or you teach others. But there is a you know witness who is saying, I, I am not a teacher, I'm not my mind, I'm not my body, I'm not my soul, you know, I am not, only the wholeness is. So from the wholeness perspective, there's no teaching, there's sharing, oh, yeah. sharing my own self. If that's a teaching, so be it. Well, we can so, say that about anything. I mean, I could ask yeah. you what you had for lunch and you say, I don't eat lunch, you know, I'm, the, I am the pure really self, the, the body now. eats. Yeah, but it's really crucial because if you see me as a teacher, mm -hmm. then you don't know, I know. You see, I'm giving you my knowledge, mm -hmm. but you know, but not being a teacher, I'm not giving you my knowledge, I'm giving you my experience. What you're going to do with that, it's up to you. Do you get it? Yeah, so how do you give, or, or how, okay. do, how, do, how do you, how does, meditation. go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't talk about meditation, I don't teach meditation. Okay, what happens? What I teach, I teach an obstacle to meditation. Which is? Which is the mind. You teach that the and mind the, is an obstacle. That's what I teach. Okay. You, see, you cannot teach meditation. How can I teach you to be yourself? I cannot do that. I can only guide you that you can teach yourself how to be yourself. No, you cannot teach yourself how to be yourself. You can only unlearn everything that you know about yourself, then you will be yourself. So I can only guide you in that process that you can realize it yourself. And that's not teaching, they're just guiding. But even to guide someone, you know, you cannot guide blind men to see the sun. You know, so you can describe the sun for him, but he's not going to see it anyway. He, he's going to assume what sun is according to your description. You know, so it's not a teaching, it's a guiding, but it's not guiding at all. It's just having fun there and whoever is hooked to that teaching, whatever, that guiding, fine, good someone is going to benefit from it. Okay. So, um, so, I don't teach meditation. What I teach people is how to be absolutely attentive while they are meditating. How do you teach that? I, how do I teach that? I teach you to really accept yourself the way you are. And, you know, when you try to accept yourself the way you are, you are meditating. So, if I were to come to one of your classes, and uh, you, what do you do? What actually happens in those classes? I don't know what happens. It happens something that even I'm surprised in watching it. You know, you cannot teach masses anything. You can only teach individuals because individual, you can understand the individual, you can penetrate the individual, his soul, his mind, his consciousness. You can see where he's stuck with. You know, what kind of obstacles are there? What kind of barriers? What kind of worries? What kind of things are preventing him to be himself? And then you try everything possible in your power to guide that people or whatever, teach that people how to be attentive to those moments, not to overpower the consciousness of that person. And then, you know, inevitably, if you remove the uh, the stone preventing spring to flow, you know, obviously the spring will flow somewhere else or it will not, you know, flow at all. We remove this, you know, the stone, the spring goes. Fresh so, water filling the ponds. So do you do a lot of work with individuals? 
Yeah, I do lots of work in the New Jersey. Uh, you see, when you read all those books, which are transcripts from my meditation classes, you know, lots of people are saying they have a re really hard time to understand. I mean, it's not for popular masses. It's not like for everyone to read about, like, you know, let's explain the now from the Tola, you know, Eckhart Tolle's perspective, and it becomes popular. Everyone reading, to, you know, you cannot read my my books if you have never ever been in meditation and being stuck to particular aspect of meditation where you cannot go further. Mm -hmm. And then you go there. I can help you with that. I mean, it's not like I'm helping you from the plane of enlightenment. I'm helping you because I experienced that. Mm -hmm. I experienced my mind putting obstacles to me, being me, you know, so many times, infinite times. And I always beat myself. I always, always f felt guilty and, and trying to find a reason to torture myself through the mind by, you know, uh, trust, denial, you know, doubt, acceptance, you know, hate, this and that. Even, even that. now or it used to happen? No. It's... Not anymore. <laughs> yesterday, was, yesterday does not exist at all. It's only in your mind. So you don't get into these self-beating up phases anymore. That's a th You're just referring to the way you used to be? I don't know. Maybe I'm beating myself, but I'm not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I really don't know. Okay. I don't know. I, I, what I know, I, what I know is that everything is the way it should be. It's not according to my idea how things should be, but according to the feel of it. You know, and the feeling is much closer to now than than your thinking. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me too. Um, I don't know if if uh, um, I, do, do you think that someone hearing a statement like that, everything as it should be, and the feeling is closer, you know, than thinking. Do you think that just hearing a statement like that can help a person begin to see life that way? Or what more can be offered to help a person see and live you life see, that way? It's every word is a vibration affecting you. Right. You know. So whether the word is coming from the mechanical aspect of your mind or from the consciousness using the mind to express it in a very kind and gentle way mm -hmm. to enhance and help and you know uh, you know help the person. That's all. You see, so, you know, you can damage the person with the thought or you can enhance the person with the thought. But imagine the thought being used in more, uh, in more meditative way. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm passing that, that little jewel. It's called mantra. You see, that's mantra. I'm giving you the seed of the wholeness. So in this, in that world, you know, in that, in, in that, uh, you know, world. So it's not about you analyzing the word. It's not about you trying to figure out what he is thinking. It's about feeling the energy embedded in that thought, feeling the consciousness embedded intent. Right. Intent is always good, you see, and then self-realizing it through the understanding, but not from your mind, but from your heart. So you should feel the person beyond his talk. Mm -hmm. feel the consciousness beyond the thought, you know, and that's, you know, inevitable transformation will happen and then transcendence will happen on its own. So you're saying that, you, uh, I think you're not saying that you literally give mantras for people to meditate with, you're saying that everything you say is a mantra. It is mantra, why not? I think that's what everything you're saying. Everything you say is a mantra, you see, yeah. As I said, uh, giving is the act, not act of kindness, but act of compassion. Mm -hmm. You are not giving because I want to give. I'm giving because there's no other way. You see, right. when you are love, when you are love, what do you do? You just give around. You share with them. It's not like I'm very proud of my love. I'm going to give, you know, amount, a certain amount to this person, certain amount to that. It's very, it's not exclusive. It is all inclusive. And when you realize yourself, when you understand yourself, when you know yourself, when you being yourself, you don't know how you know, but you know that you know, then you share it compassionately mm -hmm. with everyone, with that existence. I used to teach my kid how to, you know, approaching the tree and picking up the leaf, you know, please say thank you. 
before picking the lid. Do not say sorry, because sorry is going to be a very apologetic, and then it's the mind. Say thank you. You know, say, because there is a reason why you're picking it. You know, say, because you recognize yourself in that leaf and you are saying thank you. Thank you for that recognition. You see. So when you recognize yourself in everything you do, everything you are, everything you experience, what's left? Nothing than you. You recognize yourself. And when you recognize yourself, when you see yourself, when the kid sees itself in the mirror, it smiles. It's very joyful. Whoa, heavy. Hello. <laughs> and that kind of thing. Yeah, I recognize myself. I'm very happy because I am the one. Because there is only one. Yeah, question is how to do that. You say when and you... There's no, it, you know, listen, it's not about how to do that. What is the stopping the process of realizing that you are already that? Yeah, you tell not me. Not how, because you tell when me. you say how, there is a distance. What is? How is the problem? Mm -hmm. You know, how to do the meditation. It's not how to do the meditation. What is the meditation? And when you understand the meditation, meditation is every day living with the consciousness. That's what meditation is. Being aware in every aspect of your life. It's not about object related. It's not like I'm going to meditate on this. I'm going to meditate about. It's not about. It's not a distance. It's a, it's a closest as you can. It is realizing that you are the source of all that is and you are the source of all that isn't you are fully fully present in the moment and when you're fully present in the moment there is no need to go anywhere else than stay in that moment you see and then everything that comes from that moment will come using certain tools to designate create and accommodate someone if there is a need. That's the mind as a tool between all other realities and this reality. The mind is a tool, but mind has to be no mind in order to be used as a mind. Consciousness has to be present. So without consciousness, everything is futile. Everything is going to be totally, you know, it's going to be robot-like without consciousness. And that's the reason why why certain forces are not allowing people to wake up, but people are waking up. People are being more and more themselves because they realize what's the obstacle for not being themselves. Mm -hmm. They realize the lies and cheats and, and, and conspiracy, not against them, not against the world or God or whatever, against their consciousness and they start waking up. Waking up means removing the ignorance, removing something that is stopping you to realize that you are the one with full power. You are the consciousness and you are the awareness. So in the bio that I read, uh, you said that um, you authentic rooting in the unknown provides you with the insight and ability to be of great service to the evolution of consciousness in these most transformative of times. So I agree that these are transformative times. I think there's a lot of change happening and it's actually for it good. Every every time is transformational, but this is more intense one. This is accelerating. It's like, like putting things on the right perspective. Yeah, and uh, so uh, how is it that you are of great service? What? How do you serve? What What do you actually, when, I, presumably there's some people who have been like <laughs> interacting with you for, for years maybe. If I were to talk to one of those people and ask them, well, what is it that, you know, Ivan does, even does, that you find of value, that why have you been going back to him for years? How is he serving your transformation? What do you think those people would say to me? Yeah, see, first of all, I didn't write that. Oh, somebody else <laughs> Otherwise, I would not say I'm serving because to serve someone is to be less than that one you're serving. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. Uh, it's more about uh, being pivotal in the process of uh, removing the final shadow from the earth that has been, you know, in existence for so many, so many, so many, Long so time. many years. Yeah. I mean, it's just a time to really say enough is enough. We are moving into another layers of existence, you know, much more subtle, much more because we, you know, human, you know, human consciousness evolved from, you know, not from the primitive to the advanced one, but from not knowing to more knowing mm -hmm. or forgetting the knowledge and remembering, you know, that kind of thing. You know, everything moves in the way, you know, even the, you know, 
previous civilization used to be in the state of tranquility while someone might come with some other polluted mind and pollute everything else and it degrade and destroy itself. But there is always that kind of, you know, transformational aspect of it. So we are we are at the top where either we'll totally collapse as a as a earth or we are going to evolve into another per, another parallel reality where everything will be right but mm -hmm. all that depends on the individuals mm -hmm. you see it's sort of like a time where we we are uh, it, it's very it's very uh, uh, absolutely incredible time we live in where the person inside consciousness deciding whether to be attached to the mind or whether to be detached from the mind that's the that's the that's the battle between you know evil and good you know dragon and and uh, you know russian dragon and uh, uh you know whatever the eagle and the dragon you see uh so that's the fight you see mm -hmm. so we're gonna choose everyone has to choose and already i see people choosing you know even even elections are are designed in a way that you can choose you know whether to have cholera or whether you have cancer you know, you know everywhere around the world it's like there is no real choice the choice is always one-sided but individually whether you are gonna accept the reality that someone is imposing on you or whether you will create the reality you want to live in mm -hmm. and when you want to live in that reality obviously you're creating parallel reality and going forward and everyone who who feels that's the reality they want or they would like to live they're gonna join in for formulating and uh, manifesting that reality as parallel reality somewhere that the life will continue on mm. so you know you're you're my 400th interview and if i were to ask all the 400 people i've interviewed you know about this idea of a big transformation taking place uh, in the world probably almost all of them would say yeah i think it's it's really happening and if i were to ask them about you know how do you feel like you're contributing to it you're, you're an instrument there are many many different instruments but you're one instrument you know what is your particular function as an instrument in helping bring about this transformation on individual and collective levels most of them would probably have some sort of answer so if i were to ask you that question i just i am i'm asking you now what would be your answer my answer is, <laughs> what's my contribution? Everyone is contributing. Even small kid playing, kid playing with stones at the lake, throwing a stone little in the lake is mm -hmm. affecting the entire universe. Yeah. You see, and people yeah. dropping bombs on Syria are, are having it's an effect too, but yes, that's not necessarily effects, the effect we want. You know, you affect because duality is not is not in conflict. They are complementaries. You know, whatever right. is happening negative in the world is not really negative. You know, it is the perception of negative, but it is helping someone else to get out of the of the prison. So, my contribution. Uh, I don't have idea of any contribution. I'm contributing by being myself and having urge to share what I know. Okay. So but that, I don't know anything. You know, see, I don't know anything, but I know that I am, and I share whatever comes along, mm -hmm. whatever pops in, because something will always pop in. Mm -hmm always pop in nothing nothing can pop out because when something pop out it becomes different mm. there is a distance it's called separation popping in that's what the process is if if i help i mean that's the idea behind which is not my idea but well, let's contemplate about that the idea if if i change one person's perception of himself is going to influence his immediate surrounding and then those influenced will surround. It's like a it's like a wave when you throw the stone, mm -hmm. like a little kid, you see that kind of that kind of effect yeah. around the earth. I mean, I I'm receiving still so many letters and emails. It's like daily. Mm -hmm. I mean, people thanking me because I said something along the way, talking about whether something which for me was okay. We are chit chatting and that person saying thank you you said something whatever that changed my life huh. I was not intending to change but you know it, it is the idea in people's mind whether I hold the knowledge or not whether someone holds the knowledge or not whether the so one is on the top of the mountain claiming I know I see you know guys down there you don't see what I can see climb up and you can see what I could see is it that kind of thing hmm. 
So you're an artist. You still do art? You still I'm do not an artist. I just do art. <laughs> okay, so you do art. And you, you're making yantras or something, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it's my love. Explain what a yantra is. Yantra? Yeah. Yantra is, is a device. It's a machine. It's a machinery. It's a, it's a portal uh, to higher level of consciousness. I mean, there is no higher, there is no lower, but there is more and more and more of consciousness. That's the idea behind higher consciousness. More and more, because everything is moving to be more and more and more and more. That's the infinity expanding in in itself, infinitely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Yantra serves as a machine because it contains the seed in its center. And the seed is the dot. And the dot is the consciousness. And if you look at the dot, then you're looking at yourself. All other forms in the Tiantra are helping you to move your attention into the center where the dot is, called Bindu, called Sperm, called uh, the point, the middle point. The trouble between observer and what is being observed is called witnessing. You see, you're witnessing yourself. It's the, it's the tool to really reunite with your consciousness on a very, very existential level. And so, um, so I, you, yeah. create, you create these yantras, I guess some people buy them and uh, some people might I, just look at pictures of them on your website or something. Yeah. How, how would a person use a yantra as a tool to bring about some kind of effect? Just look at the just looking look at, at the it? center. Just, and for like five minutes, one hour, whatever? Ten, ten minutes as long as you can stand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there is no pat there is no pattern in how you're gonna meditate and what kind of, you know, meditation you imply in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, everything can be used as meditation. Washing dishes can be meditation. Walking can be meditation. Just talking can be meditation. Everything can be used as a meditation if you include the observer. Mm -hmm. If you include the witness, if you include yourself in that process, but 99.99% .99 of people are locked in their thinking, not including themselves in that process, thinking about this, thinking about that, always going into the future and the past. And to be present in the moment is to include yourself. Mm -hmm. You are aware that you are. You are aware of someone else. You are aware of the object. You are aware of this and that, but you are at the same time aware that you are. Mm -hmm. That's the process. That's the meditation. So it's not closing your eyes. Yes, it can help you to go deeper into meditation, but with open eyes, walking, talking, even this is meditation, mm -hmm. you see, because there is just aspect of being there. We are not, we are not collecting and hoarding anything. We are just moving. We are experiencing. So when you look at the dot, only the dot, and looking at the 10 minutes, you're not engaged in anything outside. You're not engaged in your mind, within your mind. Your, your mind is focused on one dot. And your awareness is looking at the dot, meaning looking at the mind. Because mind is looking at the dot. Now you are looking, including yourself, you are looking at the dot by looking at the mind. After 10 minutes, you close your eyes. You're not concerned about peripheral vision. It's going to remember everything, every single line, every single pointer, every single color, every single, because colors brings feelings, mm -hmm. you see, while lines are very, you know, very conceptual. It's like uh, working on images. So when you close your eyes after 10 minutes, what do you see? You see the image, yantra embedded in your blackness of your mind, mm -hmm. and you look at that. Mm -hmm. Now this is the first glimpse of you looking at bloody mind mm. and you don't have any clue what you're looking at you just see the pressure moving and running all those lines all those colors are melting and moving depends on what kind of yantra is spinning this way spinning that way contracting extract it's just moving in your mind in my mind and then you are there present looking at that movement and then it just disappear. Mm. What you're left with is, is the presence of being yourself. You're just aware that you are in that blackness, in that nothingness, nothing mm. else exists. And you can stay there forever if you want. Mm. And maybe the mind might invite you and say, that's it, of 
you know, bullshit, yeah. come out. Time, time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> time to go on. Time to engage in this reality. We have so many things to accomplish. You know, you are just wasting your time here. <laughs> now, that's an interesting description that you just gave. Um, it reminds me of something in Kashmir Shaivism. That I forget the name of the of the scripture. It's complicated, but it, there's this thing where it itemizes 112 ways to transcend. And um, I bet you, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if yantras is one of them. But you know, but the basic idea with with, with sound, for instance, you can take a sound, start with a, a audible sound, have it go quieter, 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 quieter. quieter. And then, just on the thought level, then it just disappears altogether, and you've transcended. But you, what you just described is the very same process with a visual thing. You know, you start yeah, with right. eyes open. You're staring at the dot. After ten minutes, close the eyes. You still see it. it, it then it becomes more and more and more subtle, disappears, and you're left with the self. Nice. That's right. Yeah, yeah. but the antra, the antra is based on 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 sacred geometry principles. Right. I mean, there are. You know, five archetypal shapes there. You mm -hmm. know, uh, the dot, the line, the triangle, circle, and the square. Mm -hmm. You know, all other geometrical forms are formed from those five basic principles. You know, linked with the five aspect of humans, five stars. You know, five you know aspects of stars. Mm -hmm. You know, five is is really the 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 the, the number that is the you know uh, almost at the end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. That's called the cycle, where the you know three and three are uniting in six, and six is the flower of life. You see, three is the male aspect, another three is the female aspect. When they reunite together, when two triangles come together, blue and red together, hem hermaphrodite state, you know, Merkaba and all of those things, that's the number six. So five is the final moment before the melting. It's that's like a sexual act where the first spark of light will be born, you know, sort of like a sperm and an egg meeting and creating another, another form, another, you know, an extension of, of two is the third, which multiplies into the many. Mm. That's how your body is born, was born. Yeah. Do you so depending on the antra, depending mm -hmm. on the antra, what kind of what kind of image will be there? Whether that image will calm you or really, you know, make you dizzy or make you in fear or you know whatever. But you know, I'm choosing. You know, I'm allowing people to choose intuitively what they feel safe with. There are certain images if I present them, you know, yantras and give them and say meditate on that, might really give the nightmare. Mm -hmm. You see. Yeah, yeah. Try to watch yourself in the mirror, your face with the with the candle on the side, and see what happens. I mean, uh, some people got really crazy. After. Gets all some weird people and got distorted, schizophrenic. Yeah, yeah. because change, face is changing. So imagine, mm -hmm. you know, imagine, imagine, uh, imagine the reality and the signs and forms we all are faced with that we have to digest. You know, imagine the amount of information we have to, you know, in on TV channels where the, those yantras, which are destructive yantras, are bombarding us and you're know, watching and being hypnotized, you see, and then being zombies, you see, and then, you know, being worker warriors and slaves, you see. But that's why the yantras are there as the aspect of, uh, uh, or attempt, or the tool uh, for the people to reunite with themselves if they want. Mm -hmm. Or if they have a urge to, you know, so our counter, our, it, it, it's a it's a counter act from those who are putting signs of, you know, don't do this, do that, you know, control of thoughts, control of body, control of, of your freedom and total, like that. So this is my contribution as well. You see, I have some contribution. Yeah, there you go. I'm contributing with, you know, this is, you know, in a way, I don't know. It's it's been forever that kind of meditation practice, but no one ever talked about it. I used to meditate on yantras when I was ten year old kid. I mean, draw the yantra, draw the triangle and the dot in middle, and I would hold the paper while you know math teacher is talking equations. I would watch the dot in the zolaga go into my you know tranquil state of not being you know not listening what she's talking about. <laughs> that kind of thing. So in a way. Inevitably, that I had to invent, you know, present this as my contribution to this, you know, yantra meditation. I mean, yeah. Amongst all other things, I mean, 
<laughs> no, it's great. And, and just in case people don't know, it is it's an ancient traditional thing. It goes back thousands of years. You can find it in the art of, you know, Vedic India and things like that, and carved in stones and whatnot. So, so, so are you saying that there's um, different yantras have different effects on different people? Is that what you were just saying? That's right. Mm. You know, the line can affect you tremendously. Can it can bring the the fear? Just, just, just draw the black line uh, on the pavement, you know, and see what happens when people pass by and see that line on the pavement with the chalk, black mm -hmm. chalk, and see what happens. Some people will pass, they'll not, those who notice, you know, then you will see the, the result is going to be, <coughs> hmm. and it's like, oh, I recognize something ancient in me, maybe a snake, yeah. maybe a stick, maybe a laser light is like uh, a line of mm -hmm. laser, I, that kind of shock is there. It's ancient. It is archetypal, you see. So it's affecting us in, in, in so many ways. Triangle is affecting us at the moment because the triangle, uh, when you're driving the, you know, through the street, is saying, ah, stop, mm. you know, say, warning, there are danger, some kind of danger, you see. Some kind of things you have to do, you have to make an effort really to save yourself because driving becomes an issue of safety, not actually an issue of pleasure, you see. It becomes like, I have to fight now to come to my destination and I have to be warned what to do. It's sort of like a society controlling you in a way, subconsciously controlling your mind. Well, if we didn't have stop signs and stoplights oh, and course. things like that, we'd all be crashing into each other. Of we'd... course, but I'm just, I'm just <laughs> explaining the way which is, which is, which is the, to control, which I'm not saying is good or bad, but it is the fact it is controlling, while you can use the same triangle to enhance yourself, enlighten yourself, you see what mm. I mean? Not controlled in any way. I mean, it, it is good because so many crashes will happen, people are unconscious. Okay, but, you know, you can use it. Well, this brings up an interesting point, which is that perhaps there can be freedom within constraints. In other words, they're taking traffic as an example. There has to be control or else there would be chaos and there would be people. You see, be, people I, you know, I am absolutely thrilled that Donald Trump is the president. You know why? Why? Because it's not that I love him and I support him in any way. Because he, his actions and his thoughts and his selfish act uh, is uh, it's just all about him. It's all about him and uh, can ignite consciousness to awake around the world. It's kind of, yeah, I've heard people say that. It's, it's, it's kind of having that effect. All kinds of people who are complacent are getting out in the streets and holding signs and, you know. It's exactly. When someone comes to you and slap you in the face, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to see what, what I would do at the time. But I, might get back. I wouldn't just say but slap me again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but if you if you are, if, you, if you are conscious enough and say thank you for slapping me, mm. I wanted to slap myself for a long, long time. Thank you. I'm really grateful that you're slapping me. Mm. Then you know, absolutely, transformation will happen inside of you. you see? But usually, the reaction will be either hitting back or arguing or suing or going into the process or whatever. Mm. Maybe that's why Jesus said, "Turn the other cheek." <laughs> Could be <laughs> the trick. I mean, that's the declaration by the Jesus saying, "I'm not my body." I mean, you can hit my body as much as you want. You can torture my body. Oh, I'm not my body. You see, mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of idea is behind that trick. You know, anyway. Yeah. But you know, interpret however you want to interpret because you have your own mind thinking. You have unique thinking. You know, that's the idea behind everyone. Every, you know, every person in the world, you know, my thinking is very unique. My thoughts are very unique. I, I created the thought, but actually thoughts cannot be created. Thoughts cannot really come up, you know, you cannot invite them. You mm -hmm. see, they are just randomly popping, you know, randomly popping. They're popping either from the intention or they're popping out of intent. Be either being used by your mind or using your mind by being consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, I was reading your, oh, let me think. Okay, just one more thing about yantras before we move on from that. Um, so, I think you're saying that a yantra is not something that has any intellectual meaning. It's not something to be understood or analyzed or written about in terms of an explanation, but it has more of a kind of a vibrational significance, um, just like a mantra does. I mean, a mantra doesn't really, isn't really supposed to have a 
specific meaning, but it, as a sound, it has a certain influence. Would you say the same yeah. of yantras? Yeah, uh, mantra mm -hmm. is similar to yantra. Right. One is uh, the one, sound device. One is a sound, one is a visual. A visual. So what's, ma you know, you will understand the yantra when I explain what mantra is. Mm -hmm. Mantra Fair. is a trick, simple a trick. Mm. The master, the guru, being in relation to you, but in order to be in relation to you, he has to be in relation to himself. Mm -hmm. There's no relationship. There is no ship traveling between, you know, master and student. There is a relation. So the master recognize, recognizes itself in the, you know, in the in, in disciple. So anyway, and understanding the moment, building the moment, building the fire, building the temperature, you know, a master is building, understanding, reacting, you know, influencing, moving energy, this and that, triggering, you know, uh, challenging, you know, removing all kinds of things is happening there. It's a huge, big relationship, while from the perspective of the master, it is a relation. I'm helping myself to be myself through that person in a way. So at one point, there will be absolutely need to absolutely push the person into the abyss and say, now you realize, you know, and that's the mantra, giving and whispering the mantra, whispering something that is absolutely significant for that person, just individual. If I say that mantra to someone else, that person might be damaged or might be not really be it's just like push it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a spice that the food can be tasty mm -hmm. you know but the problem is that those who didn't understand the point of mantra they become you know become obsessed by the idea of practicing mantra and the mantra becomes subjective it becomes repetitive so you are repeating mantra 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 until you hypnotize your mind thinking that you are enlightened or you are in, on spiritual journey, but it's not, it's just repetitive, very boring, you know, mind <laughs> exercise. It would be. Yeah. No, I think the yantra is the same. You just see it, stay there, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, I think a yantra or a mantra is like a boat in the sense that you know, you're crossing a river in a boat. The, the, the idea is not to always stay in the boat. It's to get to the other side of the river and then get out, out of the boat. So, you know, a mantra fades away, disappears, and you're, the self is realized. Or a yantra, like you were saying, you, you fades away, disappears, self is realized. It's just a different, right. different channel for the same thing. I love certain sects in India where they don't have statues of God or Buddha or whatever. They will build one when they're they are in festivity when they want to celebrate for three days they will build a statue of Buddha they will light a fire adore it kiss it polish it mm -hmm. bring food and celebrate yeah. you see and then after three days the monsoon will come and wash those little monuments whatever mm -hmm. you know how it comes and goes you know it's very transitional like the Tibetan sand paintings similar idea yeah, sand paintings and the same with the antra you can draw your antra that's why I was drawn into yant making yantras even though i didn't realize it i was drawing yantras it was like my way of escaping from consensus reality mm. you know in a way that was a rebellion act <laughs> when i was a kid while i was studying and playing football and basketball i was drawing something on the street and being called weirdo <laughs> yeah. I'm very glad that I've been called weirdo. Otherwise, you know, I rebelled more. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be a weirdo. Well, sometimes my wife says to me, I do something, and she says, nobody does that. And I said, that's why I do it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't want to do what everybody else does. Um, so you, you wrote a book called The Middle Point. I've been reading that. Um, what is The Middle Point? It's you. Oh, yeah? You wrote a book about me? Oh, thank you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's you. It's you in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Middle point. You are the point. Mm -hmm. And you are always in the middle. But you are not aware of it. Bring awareness to yourself. Then you will be the middle. In the middle. You will be the now. Yeah, see? And you will be the point. Mm. Because, you see, Copernicus said that, you know, said that Earth is not center of the 
universe it is the sun and right. he was persecuted what i'm going to say that it's not the sun it's not central sun there is nothing out there you are the center of the universe mm -hmm. it's all about you you are the oneness i mean you can think that way and then be egotistic and think that you are donald trump okay or you can you know use that and be all right with that, like God being almighty, but not using his power, just enjoying himself in the creation, creating itself. Mm -hmm. it, God, does, God is not creating the world. Creation is creating itself. God is just aware that God is. Awareness is. That's all. You see? So when you are aware, and I'm aware, what's the difference between me and you? There's no difference. It's just one. You're aware, I'm aware. Aware of what? Of nothing. I'm aware of nothing as well. So it's awareness. Mm -hmm. In that nothingness, you are present. That's what awareness is. There's no objects of other things that you can be, you know, witnessing and being aware of, being conscious of. It's just you. So you are the center of the universe. There's nothing out there. It's just illusion, a mirage, coming and going, moving and transforming. You are there present in witnessing your witness and my witness is the same witness. We express the witness through the mind differently. That's the differentiations. That's the fragmentations. But in existential level, on existential level, you and I are different. There is no difference. You are me, me, and you are, you know, I'm you and you are me. Mm -hmm. Light that is one, though the lamps be many. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's consciousness. It's the movement. You know, it's the wave. Nothing. A wave are the same waves. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I wrote that. I actually copied and pasted all the all the little chapter headings from your book and all the little section headings as as main points. And there's many many things we could talk about here. But um, you know, what comes to your mind? Uh, uh, is there anything else that in, you'd like to talk about in this interview that you think would be interesting for people or that's interesting for you, you know, that really sort of inspires you that you want to discuss a little bit? Uh, not that I would discuss. <laughs> I don't want to discuss anything. You just ask me a question and I answer. So. Yeah, I'm just saying, I, is there know, anything is, I'm it, missing it, here? It is, that... difficult, it is difficult to ignite something and say, this is really important for me. Because if I want to choose something that is really important, then then how to choose amongst infinite possibilities what's mm. so important? Maybe what I'm more excited about, you see. I'm excited about talking what I'm talking. So let's just talk and see what happens. You okay. see, uh, I mean, it could be, it could be, enlightening it could be just nonsense it doesn't really matter so that's good you know, that's an that's, that's an interesting go ahead i'm sorry Continue. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. what you're gonna say you said that is something i want you to finish oh uh so that was an interesting answer in itself you know because what you're saying i think is that you in a way you go with the flow you know you you respond to the impetus or to the impulse, or, and if there is, or to the catalyst, and if there is no impulse, then why respond? You know, so you kind of, you you bring out whatever is drawn from you, kind of like a reservoir. A reservoir just sits there, and the water the water doesn't flow unless somebody puts a pipe up to it, and exactly. you know, and then depending upon the size of the pipe and the kind of pipe and so on, the water flows in different amounts. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was just sitting mm -hmm. and enjoying enjoyment is all that is you know you're not driving your car you're enjoying your car you're not writing a letter you're enjoying the process of writing a letter it's all about enjoyment this life is enjoyment mm -hmm. you can make it how when you use your mind but when you're out of your mind then there is just enjoyment and someone came and said i've been watching you for 15 minutes are you alive <laughs> <laughs> or you're just sitting on a park bench are or something? Are you a sculpture? Are you, are you pretending to be someone like, you know, whatever, on the street, you know, yeah. entertainment, like, you know, frozen person? Right, they have that. That's a fad these days. I don't have that to collect. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, no, it's crazy. Yes, I'm dead. You know what I'm anyway, uh, when uh, that was 2005, I think, uh, I published the book 
um, create yourself through sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. Right now, we change the title create yourself because you cannot create yourself. But anyway, that's the title uh, 17 years ago. Uh, more than that. Uh, I'm not sure. And anyway, it does matter. So, mm -hmm. uh, and Banyan Books, which is the biggest uh, spiritual bookstore in Vancouver, British Columbia, organized the event in public library and they booked a small room that can fit five, six, seven people. Like thinking, okay, he's a known, you know, wrote a little, you know, book, very cute book, but, and uh, people start coming and coming and coming. And as they had to move the, you know, they went to bigger room and bigger room until the, whatever, the biggest room they had. And 200 people came. Mm. And, uh, and I was just like, almost being frozen. I didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, one thing is to talk to individual. Another one is to talk to 10 people. Another one is to talk to 200 people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't prepare myself, but it kind of being nervous before, before the act, you see. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and uh, my son, he was very small. My son, Kai, he came to me and said, Dad, what's happening? I said, Kai, I see, I think there is anxiety there, but it's not bad. It's not good. It's just like there. It's, it's, it's a mechanism, survival mechanism. I mean, it's nature. I cannot fight my nature, but it's there. So I don't know what to do. Okay, 200 people came. I mean, I was expecting two, three, four at least, but 200. I don't know where to start from, Kai. And you know what he did say to me? What? He said, start from the beginning then. <laughs> Very good. I said, wow, thank you very much, Sam. I really appreciate it. You're my great teacher. Thank you. I'm going to start from the beginning. So I will start from the beginning about this, what I want to discuss. It's not about wanting, but it just came out from nowhere. It's about uh, Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. Theory. But you sure when you examine the, 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 the theory, it's a theory of explosion. A violent and destructive shattering, a blast, a boom. The theory of explosion is the theory of the beginning of who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, the beginning of life, the beginning of creation, existence itself. So that theory, you know, it, just if you can pay really attention to what I'm going to point here, the theory cannot exist in people's mind without another theory that the universe will explode. But that thing, explosion will be implosion in their description. So explosion, implosion. What's happening in between those two explosions? Disturbance, chaos. That's why there is that idea, order out of chaos, you know, like dict dictatorial, you know, Illuminati mindset, you know, let's create an order now. Uh, it's not because the universe is in disorder, but because of mind being in disorder. Mm -hmm. Mind accepting the the idea that the universe was born out of explosion and it's going to die out of explosion. What's in between is another set of anxiety. When you compare that to your life, you were born anxious, you're going to die anxious. In between, you're anxious. We are trying to understand why we are anxious. We are trying to get rid of anxiety, trying to get rid of pressure and stress and problems and difficulties and and in, you know unfairness and you know, violence and injustice, terrorism and this and that. We are in fight to create the peace. The peace is already here. Remove the concept. Remove the idea of the universe being out of born out of explosion and there is another confirmation from the from the religious point of view that the you know the universe was born out of let's there be you know let's be the light let whatever. there be light let there be let light, there be light. Yeah. so it's another explosion stellar firework and the universe was born and the darkness was formed and all of that it's a story of duality and that's the that's the main reason why we are so disconnected from who we are. It is deeply engraved in our, not subconsciousness, but in our unconsciousness, and it operates there. It is suppressed deep down through indoctrination, through repetition, through introduction, through talk, 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 until you, uh, you know, you form the mind, you see. So this is the idea. So, uh, you know, how to get rid of this idea? You cannot get rid of idea. You can only 
witness the mind and the idea will be dropped. Hmm. You know, when you compare to your life, you're born, you die. You know, what's, what's after that? We don't know. You're born from nothing, you die to nothing. But nothing, for, you know, from that, from that perspective of Big Bang, is very fearful and there is nothing really there is no life after that there is just oblivion it's just like nothing but you know it's not because nothing means the whole because everything that is cannot exist without nothing everything that exists cannot exist without nothing nothing is the course of all of that and nothing equals awareness awareness that i am so so the story is very much is very much uh you know about destruction and uh, and uh, and violence, and the story about our separation from consciousness. It is the story of our attachment to to duality, our, our attachment to the social indoctrinated illusionary mind. And you know what? There is something else more stupid than that. It is the confirmation of that dualistic approach and imprisonment of human consciousness into the reality of you know consensus. And that's the stupidity that, uh, according to certain scientific research, and that's been, in you know, introduced into the school system now, embedded in the school system, like Newton, you know, Newton law or Aristotelian law, a lot of that law which are indoctrinating us into believing that separation is, you know, real. No, it's not. It's illusion. It's you being attached to something that is not. So according to their research and the conclusion, the universe is approximately 13 point whatever, eight, nine, whatever, billion years old. Mm. You know, you know, you know that fact. And for the, but the problem is it bec if it becomes fact, then it's, it becomes. It's a theory. It's, they, they don't know for sure. But, yeah. Even if it's theory, it becomes. But how did they conduct that system in, of investigation? How did they study material and sources in order to establish that fact? You know, the universe is infinite, infinite is infinite, expressing itself in infinite ways and in infinite directions, always right now, infinitely. So how, how could they know? You know, so that kind of indoctrination. So when you really, deny, when you remove your attachment to your knowledge, when you remove your attachment to your thinking, then you will come to know. But that knowing will not be will not be mathematical and you cannot measure that knowing. That knowing will be self-evident that you are the way you are, you see. Hmm. Okay. Um, a lot of, there's a lot in what you just said. Uh, I got an email from a friend of mine yesterday who has a PhD in physics, which is somewhat related to what you were just saying. He, he said that, uh, I believe that matter acts according to the second law of thermodynamics and decreases order over time, increases entropy. That's what the second law of thermodynamics means. And, uh, however, I think there is a mirror law for consciousness that acts in reverse, a law of syntropy, he likes to call it, opposing the law of entropy. Consciousness naturally and effortlessly increases order. Matter naturally and effortlessly decreases order. The higher the consciousness, individual, planet, galaxy, universe, the more the law of syntropy, or order, prevails over the law of entropy, or disorder. Anyway, what do you think about that? Uh, the universe did not explode 13.8 billion years ago, and it is not going to implode, you know, in some, you know, distant future. The explosion and the implosion is happening right now. It is happening in this moment. Both could be the true. The universe, it is absolutely incredibly happening right now. Oh, yeah. But the point is, are you aware? Can you see it? Can you know it? The universe is expanding and contracting all the time this moment right now. Mm -hmm. It's breathing up and down. You know, just study ancient whatever writing, you know, and you see, for example, that Brahma has three aspects and Brahma is breathing in and breathing out. Mm -hmm. One is creating, another one is, you know, destroying, while in the middle one, the, you know, Holy Trinity, one is maintaining, right. meaning there is a yin and yin, there is yang, and there is you maintaining, you know, the, you know, and that's what triangle is, mm -hmm. you see. So, the birth of the universe is still happening right now, and the death of the universe is still happening right now. 
you know, but scientists cannot comprehend that at the moment because they are locked in certain, you know, idea how things function. For example, just I read this morning that 30 scientists, including that uh, scientist uh, from London, Stephen uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking wrote a letter. Stephen Hawking, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that uh, that uh, condemned the uh, idea that, you know, the universe is not according to certain standards and principles they are fighting for and they are trying to prove for ages. I mean, someone is really trying to knock them down and say, guys, expand, you know, include something else. This is not the way the universe works. <laughs> but, you know, it's the same like, you know, one-pointed, blinded, people who were investing so much into their theory that someone tried to destroy their theory, what are you going to do naturally? You're going to say, you know, get lost, keep me here. That's why there is a fight. Yeah. So existence expressing itself as life through the explosion and imploding life back at the existence to the existence right now. That's what life is. So the, the universe was not born long time ago. The universe will not end sometime in the future. The universe is infinite. It was not born. It never dies. Well, yeah, it sounds like you're our, our 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 comprehension and our our level of thinking cannot cannot really grasp that, you know, at all. I mean, you know, it's just like how can I explain? How can you explain infinite? There is no way. Mm -hmm. Everything a... is connected. Everything is complementary. Uh, appreciative to every aspect of the of the wholeness of the existence. Everything is pulsating, moving, transforming, coming and going. The whole point is, are you aware of that happening or not? That's yeah. the whole point. Well, you just said something a minute ago about not being too certain of your ideas, and, and yet you're speaking now in a very sort of adamant, certain tone. I would say that, you know, all kind, there's all kinds of possibilities. Um, one is that the universe is emerging uh, from moment to moment continuously. And also that it actually started 3.7 billion years ago, and both can be true simultaneously. So there's all kinds it's of true. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's true, but it's not entirely true because there, there is a truth and there is ultimate truth. What's the ultimate truth? I don't know how I know, but I know. I'm, someone might not agree with me. That's all right. You know, you can agree, disagree. It's up to you. Yeah, you know, you're free to express yourself the way you are. Well, I don't think anything we can we can express is going to be the final truth or absolute or complete no. truth. There's always but more. In my knowing, you know, it is right now. Oh, yeah. And right now can express itself in infinite ways and infinite levels and densities. So, you know, the idea that the universe was born that way, it's true in a way, but it's not entirely true. It's not ultimately true, no. you see. But when you stick to the aspect of the truth, then it becomes a lie. You know, don't get stuck to the aspect. That's the, you know, those guys sending 30 scientists, sending letter to one article in, you know, American science about uh, questioning their, you know, idea about the universe is that attempt, you know, you see, let it go. Yeah. Allow that guy to enter into your field of knowledge. He's going to compliment. You just keep moving on. That's the consciousness moving, expanding. And, you know, uh, becoming more and more of itself. Yeah, this is an old pattern. If you, if you read Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he talks about paradigms as being certain packages of understanding and how they tend to be resistant to change, but that as more and more anomalies, things that contradict the paradigm begin to accumulate, at a certain point the paradigm has to eventually collapse and give rise to a new paradigm. So there's always some resistance to change, but then the, there's always, and which is good because as you're saying with Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, there's, there's some stability that is necessary for everything not to be complete chaos, and that applies exactly. to... Exactly. Yeah, so that applies what's the, to... What's the, what's the main ingredient in that stability? Um, it's you. It's your consciousness, being conscious that you are. That's the stability, mm -hmm. you see? That's why I like, uh, I like uh, the, you know, I mean, I, it's not like liking or disliking. It's more like being drawn into the, you know, into the perspective of holographic reality, mm -hmm. you see, it, you know, the hologram is, uh, you know, photographic process that uses la laser coherent light 
of the same wavelength right. to produce dimensional image in space. So, mm -hmm. you know, every single aspect of, 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 of uh, you know, of that in that space, every aspect, every point is the, you know, it's the whole. Yep. You know, a complete three-dimensional image can be cut into many pieces and each piece will still be capable of reproducing an image of the whole. So, the holographic perspective is a complete multi-dimensional frame of references as opposed to linear perspective for reality, you know. Changing a single component of the holographic uh, sim simultaneously change the, you know, the other aspect, mm. you know you know, other component, a component within it. So the world uh, and the world and everything in it is the projections from the level of reality beyond the horizon of our comprehension. Yeah. So God is a hologram. The universe is a hologram. The wholeness is a hologram, a projection of nothingness from where everything else comes. So the holographic universe is just awareness within an infinite number of simultaneously coexisting ways to experience it. How do we experience the infinite angle of holographic projections? Through the perception of the consciousness. What radio channel you are on determines what kind of music you get, mm -hmm. you know? So on the air where there are other channels, but you hear only the one you are tuned in, you have intent to, or you have intention to. We are capable of experiencing many angles, many different points of view, many perspective realities, many many parallel realities, many different different everything different, different aspect of the one reality because the reality is holographic, basically. Yeah. Even so, uh, but you know, interesting, interesting enough, interesting enough, in the book of Genesis, God created the world in six days. Then on the seventh, He went on vacation. You know that story. <laughs> went to Florida, so, yeah. <laughs> in Florida, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but Christians believe that the God creation happens only once. From the point of awareness, the creation is continuously happening in this moment of now. Yeah. Forming an unbrokenable whole without interruptions eternally right now in infinite directions. Every new moment of now destroys the previous moment of now. Every new moment is the creation of the moment. You see, if you can remain conscious within a moment of now and not move away from, you know, from it with your thinking, then you are in continuity of your awareness. You become God yourself, witnessing the infinite creative process of now. You are witnessing your own self expanding, not choosing, not guiding, not struggling, just being. Being is God. That's what awareness is. That's what holographic universe is. Yeah, you know this thing about this continuously emerging universe, to, to the credit of physicists, they actually do have an understanding about that. I think they call it sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking. And what they mean by that is that there is, at all times, a unified field, a, a completely synchronous, whole, a complete non-fragmented level of creation yeah. and from that greater and greater complexity and diversification arises but this isn't something that happened 3.7 billion years ago it's something that happens continuously uh, as uh, you know every moment as you say hey a question just came in um, from someone named Shri in Stanford Connecticut uh, Shri asks what is it that's not moving in us what is it yeah what, not yeah, what is it in us that's not moving? <laughs> if I say what's moving, what's not moving, then actually it starts moving. <laughs> Would it? It's going to start. If I say what's not moving, that is the inviting that non-movement to move. Can it? Is, is there something which can actually remain non-moving despite all the movement and despite all the diversity yeah, and course. change and, and that can't be moved no matter There's what? There's a little mantra you can use. I mean, meditation technique. I, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, using your mind in very uh, uh, practical way, using one thought only. Mm -hmm. That thought is illusion. So you can use that thought that's called in, in, in Buddhism, you know, Buddha used to say, you know, remember, remember, remember that you are. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But you remember that you are, you have a thought that you are. But at one point, the thought is going to be useless because the thought is going to say, oh, who is that? You know, who is that who is thinking one thought? And then consciousness will turn into itself and then realize the awareness, attain the awareness. And that's the trick of Buddha using that. It's a, it's a trickery anyway. So what is in the moment? You know, what is the moment? What is the stillness? What is the peace? What is the tranquility? What is that thing that never, ever moves? You asking me? Yeah, it's, I'm just like, you know, talking. <laughs> uh, it's like, like building a pressure <laughs> mm. <laughs> until the popcorn pop. It's awareness. That's what I would have answered. Yeah, consciousness. Awareness. Awareness. awareness it, you know, you cannot be aware of awareness. You can be conscious of consciousness. Mm-hmm. But when the consciousness is conscious of itself, then it becomes awareness. Awareness simply is aware. Mm-hmm. There is nothing else to be aware apart from being aware. And even there is no awareness of self. There is only awareness. That's called bliss. That's called nirvana. That's mm-hmm. called enlightenment. When there is only awareness. It's not like you have special power and you are walking like, you know, like like enlightened Buddha around with a big smile on your face. It is like just a state of being, state of state of pure that's awareness what light is that's what pure light is mm-hmm. pure light means no heaviness means that you are pure light you are you're lighter than the than the you know than the air lighter than the vacuum lighter than anything you can imagine and you can think about you know you are totally free that's you're not suppressed you're not compressed you're not locked in your thinking you're free from your thinking Mm -hmm. you feel i'm relaxed oh i'm aware that i am but no no i'm conscious that i'm conscious but i cannot be aware that i am i'm just aware Mm -hmm. that's what stillness is good Uh, eckhart tolle talking about stillness being the now no, now is not stillness. Now is always transformational, transitional. It always move. It always, you know, it is the movement. It's the consciousness. Real now is not the consciousness. Real now is awareness. So, I learned because, something this week. Yeah. I, I learned. <laughs> I did. I, in fact, I think I it was you, just. I want you to unlearn. I don't want you to learn. No, I, I learned something useful just yesterday. I learned that YouTube will auto transcribe now any uh, video that's under two hours. So I'm determined to keep my interviews under two hours so YouTube will auto transcribe them. So we're just about at that point and I need to, to wrap it up. Um, I also learned another thing which is that um, once you reach a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube they give you all kinds of special treatment and advice and support and whatnot I'm only at 28,000 subscribers so anyone who's made it this far in the interview uh, subscribe on YouTube just hit the little subscribe button to the channel and uh, you know I'd like to build it up to a hundred thousand but in any case to keep under the two-hour mark I, I need to conclude um, so I would like to uh, thank you for for coming on the show and for this lively discussion. Um, I will be obviously linking to your website and to your books as I always do when I interview somebody. And people can go there, take a look at your art. Um, maybe we'll even paste a couple of yantras into the video. And yeah. so, so when we mention yantras, I'll, I'll get some from you that we can paste into the video so people can see what, what we're talking about. You're free to use anything. <laughs> well, I could pull them off the website or you could even give me higher resolution ones that will go into the video. Of course. Yeah, we'll do of that. Of course. And um, anyway, so people can get in touch with you. They, and if they go to your website, they'll see what you have to offer, uh, as, as is the case with everyone I interview. So I, I appreciate having you on. I'm, I'm very grateful that you invite me and I really am grateful for this opportunity to just engage in joyfulness. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so, um, so thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, this is a weekly show, as you may know. And um, if you go to batgap.com, you'll see all the previous ones. You can sign up to be notified of future ones uh, and a lot of other stuff if you just explore around on the site there. Uh, we appreciate your attention and, and interest and support, and uh, we'll keep it going. So, see you next week. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. <laughs>